Welcome to the Keeping the Nostalgia Alive show. As you can see with me is Coach Mac Petty. Uh, but before we get to Coach Petty, I just let you guys know you're probably listening to this on Keeping the Nostalgia Alive. That's all one word, keepingthenostalgialive.podbean.com. Or you're watching this on our YouTube channel, the Keeping the Nostalgia Alive show. Um, we have, man, I think this is interview number 203. So please go through all the podcasts and uh, uh, download them and listen to them at your convenience. I mean, we have Rick Mount, we have Coach Gene Cady. Of course, we have uh, Coach uh, Mac Petty with us today. Uh, Kent Benson, you name it, we got it um, with the game of basketball. Uh, before we get started with Coach Petty, just when you think that you know everything about the game of basketball, you sit and you do a little research and, uh, you know, um, uh, find out stuff that you, you're, it's just like life. You're learning new stuff every day. And there's so much stuff that I have learned in doing the research on uh, our guest coach Petty today. And coach Petty, thank you so much for joining us, uh, before you go out and, uh, hit those, uh, links today. Well, I appreciate the offer. Uh, I was surprised that you asked me. Oh no, not at all. Um, tell everybody a little bit about where you grew up and a little bit about your family in Ohio. I uh, grew up in Worcester, Ohio, graduated from high school in 1963, uh, played basketball and baseball in high school, got scholarship offers from many schools and uh, decided to go to the University of Tennessee and play both basketball and baseball. And uh, was very fortunate growing up in Worcester, uh, had super coaches and uh, a great community and supportive family. My parents both supported me in everything I did. Uh, so it was a great uh, opportunity. Did, was your dad athletic or your mom athletic? Well, they were, I was, I was, uh, I don't know if, my dad was 39 years old when I was born, and my mom was 32. So I have a sister that's 11 years older than I am. And my dad played a lot of baseball. Uh, he was from Southern Ohio and uh, actually taught me how to pitch, taught me how to throw a curveball. And uh, uh, he loved baseball. We would go up and see the Cleveland Indians play. Uh, my mom, she said she played and she was a catcher. Uh, evidently, they played a lot of baseball at th that time. My parents both came from large families. My dad, family of 12, and my mom, a family of 13. So uh, I had a lot of uh, cousins and aunts and uncles. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, my dad uh, was a hardworking uh, person. Uh, he worked in a factory and uh, painted houses after he'd come home, but uh, he was always wanting to do things with us. Uh, when we were small, we used to sit out on the front step waiting for him to walk up the street from work, and the closer he got, the bigger his smile got, and he says, what do you boys want to do? And we said, can we go to the park and you hit balls to us? And, yep, let me go change my clothes. And he'd take me down and take all of us down to the park. And he'd hit balls so high we thought they were disappearing. And uh, we'd run around in circles and he'd just laugh and laugh at us trying to catch those pop-ups that he'd hit. And um, he used to catch me. He went to Sears and Roebuck and bought a catcher's mitt and um, would catch me. And uh, I got bigger and stronger, and finally he said, that's it. I'm not, my bifocals, his bifocals would bother me. He'd watch the ball and move his head, and he'd get hit, and that's it. He says, I can't catch you anymore. And uh, one thing that he really did with the baseball was, um, I don't know where he got it. He took a baseball and drilled a hole through it and put a rope in there and tied not on the end of the rope and made it about six feet, seven feet long and attached it to a, uh, a broomstick handle and he would swing it around and I would hit it. And um, where he got this idea, I have no idea. I mean, it was uh, you know, amazing. In fact, I did the same thing for my son. 
Um, that's how he learned how to hit both right and left-handed uh, with, with that. That was the John. That was the Johnny Bench batter up before Johnny Bench batter up. Yeah, this is nine. This is nineteen fifties. I mean, it. It. It's. It, um, I don't. Again, I don't know where he came up with it, but I. I liked shooting baskets, and I'd go to the neighbor's house, and this gentleman he taught me how to shoot a jump shot, and. Uh, and my dad, said, "Well, shoot, I'll I'll get you something." And, Instead of going to the store and buying a rim, he built me a rim from his factory. He had all the dimensions and uh, put it on the garage on a backboard, and so I could shoot baskets. And the high school wasn't very far away. And uh, once I found basketball, um, I mean, I played the baseball from the time I was five years old up you know, until I went to college, but, uh, the basketball thing got a hold of me and, um, I would get up in the morning and sneak out of the house and dribble down to the court. My mom would get mad because I wouldn't eat breakfast. Uh, it was just there. I don't know what it was. There was just something there that, uh, intrigued me. Uh, I remember in high school, I was, I was fairly tall. I was six foot three when I was a freshman and uh, played on the freshman team and you know I would start some games and not start other games and was okay and and they used to laugh at me being so tall I couldn't jump that well and um, I could get back and run and touch the rim with my fingers and I decided that uh, you know I needed to improve my jumping while our coach he challenged us with a drill he called sustained jumping, where you get under the rim and you jump up and touch it. And when you came back down, you wouldn't catch yourself. You just jump off your feet and go back up and touch it. He said, I'll give anybody $5 that can do it 15 times when you come back next October. So that summer, that's all I did. I jumped and jumped. When I went back in October, I touched the rim 25 times, got my $5. Well, that made a difference in my whole game. Uh, I would, I, on that rim, I, I, and again, I don't understand why I did this. Um, I would touch the rim 10 times, and we had an outdoor court that had six baskets, and I decided, well, shoot, I'll just walk to the next one and do it 10 times. Well, eventually I got 60 jumps and uh, I wasn't satisfied with that. So I decided to do it left-handed. So I did 60 left, build up to do 60 left-handed. And what I did was that if I, if I missed, I would go back to the beginning and start again. And um, then I wasn't satisfied with that and decided I'd do it with two hands. And Eventually, I was dunking, standing under the basket uh, just by jumping on an asphalt court. And I did the same thing as far as shooting. I'd take and uh, I found an old nail and I'd mark an X and I would stand on that X with one foot and jump up and shoot jump shots until I made 10 in a row at different distances and whatever. I had a buddy that had uh, ankle spats. They weighed five pounds each. And he never wore them. And I mowed yards and caddied, made some money. And I said, hey, how about if I buy those ankle spats from you? He says, yeah, I don't wear them. I wore those everywhere. I wore them playing ball. I wore them caddying. I wore them mowing the yard. I wore them out. Uh, they had metal or lead pellets in the sides of them. And uh, I'd put them on every day. And then I would jump with those. And, uh, you know, I just, there was something inside me. And I got a feeling it has to do with my folks. My dad, he was quite a competitor. And, uh, and so that uh, helped me, uh, you know, do the things I was able to do athletically and, and get a scholarship and go to Tennessee. 
What, uh, it, it, with the game of basketball, was there anybody that you emulated or tried to be like, or what college, or, or did you follow high school when you were that age? Was there any college basketball, professional basketball that you followed or enjoyed uh, uh, at that particular time? Well, uh, I don't know if you recall a guy by the name of Bill Musselman. Bill Musselman, you know, coached, well, he, he was five years older than I he went to my high school. In fact, I broke his scoring record my junior year. And uh, so I knew Bill Musselman, and he would come home from college and see me at the YMCA and do drills with me. And um, when I was in junior high, the Orville guys, Bob Knight was from Orville, the Orville guys would come over to the Worcester Outdoor Court and play the Worcester guys. And I, we would sit there and watch them and was always intrigued. Well, my sophomore, after my sophomore year in high school, I get a call in the summertime, and Musselman asked me if I would play with the Worcester guys against the Orville guys. I couldn't believe it. You know, here I am just a sophomore. These guys are in college. I said, sure. So I got to play against Bob Knight. I don't know, uh, John Hall's was one of Bob's uh, first assistants at IU, and John Halls was a classmate at Orville with Bob, and uh, John and I became real close friends. And, uh, but, you know, as far as emulating somebody, I emulated my high school coach. I would go watch him play in industrial leagues, and he had the most beautiful jump shot, I could believe. I wanted to shoot that shot just like him. And, uh, I would watch him shoot and then I'd go out and I'd try to emulate what he did. And, um, you know, I had favored guys, but, you know, back then basketball was black and white TV. Um, you know, the George Yardleys and different guys that were playing way back then and, and the Bill Russell's, the Celtics. Uh, I mean, uh, you only got to watch it just a little bit. Uh, we had great athletes in our area. Um, one guy was his name was Dean Chance. He played pitched for the Cal, Los Angeles Angels, and uh, he grew up in the county. And his senior year, they won the state championship in basketball and baseball as a small school. And uh, he was an unbelievable athlete. And he was always around with us at the YMCA. He he'd play us ping pong and give us 17 points and beat us 21 17. I mean. <laughs> He'd take us to the bowling alley, and he'd give us so many pins, and he'd still bowl to something. I mean, it, he was just an unbelievable athlete, and so he was around. Uh, Dick Shafraff played at uh, Ohio State and with the Cleveland Browns for 16 years, professional NFL player. Uh, I got to know him. Uh, I needed to lift weights and didn't know how to lift weights, and I went to the YMCA one day and came across him down in the lower room. And uh, he was lifting weights, and so he, so he showed me how to lift weights. Um, so, you know, it was um, – we had some great athletes, you know, all through Worcester and, and in the area. I mean, you know, look at the Canton, Canton's NFL Hall of Fame. Why? Stark County had the most NFL players of any county in the United States at that one time. Uh, I'm sure it's changed now, but still, uh, there were – a lot of great athletes all around. I played against a guy named Dick Snyder. Uh, he was from Canton North. Dick Snyder was All-American football player, All-State in football, basketball, baseball, and track. Six foot four, five, was an unbelievable athlete. Um, decided to go to Davidson University. Had all, all kinds of offers. Play and he decided to play for Lefty Drussell at Davidson. He ended up playing in the NBA uh, with uh, Portland, I think. Uh, so, you know, they're great athletes all around. Uh, the summer times in baseball, uh, I played Little League up until I was 11. And uh, then they started what they called Hot Stove, and I played it until I was 15. And then a guy from Orville asked me if I'd play in a triple-A league out of Akron and Canton. And uh, here I was, 16 years old, pitching against guys who were 25, 30 years old, been playing baseball all their life. And um, uh, it was a great experience. 
uh, to be able to do that. In fact, um, you know, I got inducted into the Akron Baseball Hall of Fame, I guess, because of that uh, participation and playing in those games. We played all over the country. Uh, baseball, I played all the time. A hot stove we would play and the and, uh, game would be over with and where we'd go? We'd go to the outdoor court and play basketball until the police came and told us to turn the lights out because the neighbors are getting tired of hearing the backboard, the metal backboards and the nets and stuff. So, you know, that's all we did growing up. You know, if you look over my right shoulder there in the corner there, I think you can see Bob is kind of with us today. I see that. Yeah, Bob <laughs> and friends. When I, uh, when I came, when I was looking at the Wabash job, I, I knew nothing about it. Um, I mean, we didn't have internet and, and all that information that's out there today about schools. And uh, uh, so I called Bob. I said, look, I, you know, I don't know anything about Wabash. Uh, I'm looking to uh, take the job. Can you help me out? And he says, well, let me get back to you. And a few, a few days later, he called me back. And he says, well, he says, people I talk to really think it'd be a diamond in the rough. It could be, uh, you know. An opportunity. Well, what I didn't realize that it went 15 consecutive losing seasons. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, and come to find out, the one person he talked to was his attorney, and his attorney was a Wabash alum. And so he had a little biased opinion about the school and the opportunities. But being from Ohio and leaving Tennessee, it felt best to get back to, you know, to to uh, basketball country, I guess you could say, because Tennessee was football country. Had a great experience coaching there, but uh, uh, my family, my two children, getting back closer to the grandparents. And uh, so I took the job. And uh, boy, the first two years were discouraging, to say the least. In fact, my son said to his mom one day, do you think people will ever come to dad's games? Uh, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, but, you know, uh, and before I came to Wabash, I was at the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee, and we had participated in the first two Division III NCAA basketball playoffs. And um, so I understood what success was about and understood what going to the NCAA term was about. But, well, boy, when I got to Wabash, that losing was really hard to break. And... Um, the third year there, we went 15 and nine or something like 14 and 10, 15 and nine. And um, it was like a thousand pounds was lifted off everybody's shoulders. So we finally had a winning season. And close to 500 victories later, here we are. Yeah, well, that, that, that's due to a lot of uh, good players. Um, what was uh, what was basketball like in Ohio? High school basketball like in Ohio, Ohio compared to what you saw as Hoosier hysteria in Indiana? Does it compare, or um, do you think Indiana wins that argument, or it, was it just similar and just Ohio just didn't get enough credit? Well, Ohio had two classes, A and Double A, and so uh, the A were the small schools and the Double A's. I mean, uh, we played teams in Akron and Canton and bigger schools, and our conference was pretty strong. Um, you know, I, I just think basketball pretty much everywhere was, was good. But, you know, again, when you talk about Ohio, you basically think football. Uh, Paul Brown coached at Maslin High School. And so, you know, you know Paul Brown's history. Uh, uh, football was big. Our my sophomore year, our football team went 10-0. and 0. They sent five guys to Ohio State. Um, Orville's football was really good. But our basketball programs were good also. And um, comparing it to Indiana, it's a little different because Indiana, I told somebody one time we had a, a dinner reception and, and uh, it was for an NCAA tournament. And... Uh, the people were talking about the success of this university in Ohio and what it had. And I looked at those folks and I said, you know, I'm, I'm from Ohio. I know their success. I said, but 
when you say Indiana, you don't say volleyball, you say basketball. I mean, and so I got indoctrinated as soon as I got there, but I knew the history of Indiana basketball. I knew what it was like. Um, I was there for a couple of years and people asked me what I thought about, uh, you know, one class, you know, do, do you think they should go to multiple classes? And I said, you started class basketball when you started to incorporate school corporations. Uh, so, you know, it, it was inevitable to happen. It was, I, I'm sure a shame. Uh, one year, one fellow was a good friend of mine. He was on the committee with uh, the IHSAA and said, um, what would you propose? What would you think would be fair? And I said, well, I thought maybe two classes. I probably got that from Ohio, but two classes, A and, a and AA. And uh, once they got past the regional, bring them all together, because I felt that the strong small schools would beat out all the weaker schools and the strong big schools would do likewise. You bring them all together and then have one champion. And then so people would win their sectionals, people would win their regionals, whether they're small or large, and uh, then they'd go on and that would be the state champion. Uh, but that never got any traction. So. Uh, now we have like five classes, four or five classes with, with the basketball, which, you know, is fine. The small schools are not going to be able to compete with the big schools as far as numbers are concerned, but uh, uh, it's in, it's the history. Uh, let's not be modest here. You, you average, if I read correctly, about 14 strikeouts per uh, time that you pitched. Tell us a little bit about the possibility that you would have gone down a path to being a professional baseball player. And what was it like to, uh, I think you were drafted by the Mets. You had the possibility of playing for the Milwaukee, uh, tryout for the Milwaukee Brewers. I did say Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee Braves. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, uh, again, I had a, an excellent high school baseball coach and, and uh, we had, as I told you before, the, the history of athletes, especially baseball players around the area were outstanding. Dean Chance. We had Joe Sparma that played pitch for Detroit from Maslin. So uh, we even had one in my high school who ended up going to UCLA and playing baseball there, Tom Sapp. And he was an unbelievable pitcher, but uh, broke his elbow at UCLA. And so that ended his career. So I'd go watch those guys pitch. Uh, one time I got to pitch at Dean Chance's high school on his mound. And uh, I mean, it, so it was great inspiration. And so, um, I don't know, I just had ability to throw a baseball hard and, and uh, was able to, to do those things. Uh, uh, you know, I had games where I had 19, 20 strikeouts in a game and uh, uh, Threw no, I threw a no-hitter one time and lost one to nothing uh, because of an error. And uh, so you, you remember those things. I went to Tennessee and played baseball and basketball. And after, well, one incident that was really interesting was August before my senior year in high school, I got a call from Dean Chance's attorney in Worcester asking me if, I could go up and have a tryout with the Los Angeles Angels. They were playing the Cleveland Indians that day, and they wanted me to come up and throw batting practice so they could watch me pitch. And so we checked it out, and everything seemed up and up. And so we took off. My mom and dad took me up to Cleveland. I put on Dean Chance's uniform and walked out on the mound. I, never, I don't remember leaving the dugout and getting to the mound. It was an unreal experience. And Bill Rigney was the manager of the Los Angeles Angels. And uh, so I threw batting practice to those major league players. And I, I would assume that that had some relevance in me getting drafted uh, because, of, of, because of that. Um, because I could throw at 93, 94 miles an hour. I had a good curveball, and uh, you know, so 
I got drafted my sophomore year by the Mets and um, officials came from St. Louis to sit down with my folks and I talking about signing a contract. And my dad, he didn't like the idea that he didn't think it was enough money. And, uh, but I was getting calls constantly from the basketball program at Tennessee to come back and play basketball. And, and I don't know, I, I made a decision to, you know, to go back to school. Um, I've always had a philosophy that you can't get ahead by looking back. Uh, yes, I could have gone that direction and no telling what would have happened. Uh, but you know, it didn't work that way. Uh, my last year in college, I was redshirt in basketball. So I was there for five years because of basketball that played baseball only four years. So my fifth year, I didn't play baseball, but I got a call from the Pittsburgh pirates a guy. I used to go and try out with them when I was in high school called me and said, uh, we'd like you to come up to Johnson city, Tennessee for a tryout. Well, I was married at that time and had a child and, and had been offered a head high school coaching position. And, but I thought, yeah, this would be kind of neat. So I went up there. He was a good guy. And I went up there and tried out. Well, after the tryout, they came to the motel and offered me a contract there. And uh, I, had to, I had too much responsibility uh, with a wife and a child. And I had something solid, a, a job. Um, I wanted to coach. And this was that opportunity to coach. And so um, I always believed that the good Lord was leading me around. Uh, he, I, never, I never went for a job. Uh, this high school job that I got, our last game, our last game at uh, uh, Tennessee, a gentleman came up to me and, and said, uh, what are your plans? And I said, well, I'd like to coach. And he says, that's what we wanted to know. We'd like to offer you our head high school coaching position. I said, really? He said, yeah. He says, we want you to come down and interview for the job. So I went down. I was in the midst of student teaching at that time. And uh, I went down and interviewed. And there was a newspaper article. They were going to hire this guy. And I thought, well, that was for naught. And so I went back. Next thing I know, I get a call from him. We want you to be our basketball coach. So I was there at that high school for three years. Had some wonderful players. Great community. I uh, got a call from a teammate who was a Converse shoe salesman. He said, hey, would you be interested in coaching in college? And I said, well, yeah. He says, well, I was just talking to the head basketball coach at Swanee, and he's needing an assistant coach, and I told him about you. And he said, well, have him call me. So I called the guy, and he said, um, yeah, come on down for an interview. I went down and interviewed and got the job. I was uh, my I was the assistant basketball coach, but I was also the head soccer coach. Uh, I never played soccer except intramurally, but uh, they went ahead with it. And coaching soccer was unbelievable. I had a I had a player on my team named Kyle Rote Jr. Kyle Rote Jr. was the first American drafted into North American Soccer League out of little old Swanee. Uh, Kyle Rote Jr was Kyle Rote's son. Kyle Rote played for the Giants. Uh, Kyle Rote was an unbelievable athlete. And I've been blessed to coach great athletes, and he was one of the first. Um, I had great high school players, but uh, this guy was unbelievable. Well, after my fifth year at, at Swanee, toward the end, well, it was probably in January, I got a call from the head coach at Rose Holman who was in our conference, he said, uh, hey, did you know the Wabash job is open? I said, no, not really. He said, I think that'd be a great job for you. He said, you need to look into it. He said, I talked to the athletic director and told him I was going to tell you, and he wants you to call him. <laughs> so I did the same thing. I called the athletic director, Max Serbies, and we talked for a while, and he said, good. He said, send me your information, and uh, I sent the information, and he called me up and set up a date for an interview, and I went up and interviewed, and next thing I knew, I got the job. I finished the season at Swanee. We went to the NCAA tournament at uh, Transylvania, hosted that year, and played, and uh, had five great seniors, outstanding young men uh, that played for me, and uh, so then I came to Wabash, and the rest is history. 
before we get a little deep into Wabash, I mean, you were offered well over a hundred scholarships coming out of high school. How difficult was it or how easy was it to make the decision to go and be a volunteer at Tennessee? What, what would have been a, the closest college uniform that you would have wore if it wasn't for Tennessee? Well, probably Ohio State. Uh, I was, I was invited there my senior year to a game and uh, recruiting visit and uh, Fred Taylor was the head coach and uh, Frank Truitt was the assistant coach. Um, you know, that it was a great experience. I got to meet Jerry Lucas. He was there and uh, uh, was a great experience. Uh, my mom had a lot to do with my decision making. Uh, and I think the coaches knew that mothers were instrumental in their son's uh, decisions. So uh, she didn't like the fact that I had to work. Um, at Tennessee, uh, you got a stipend every month, uh, laundry money. I don't know how that worked out. It was about $19, $20 a month, uh, laundry money. Well, back in 1963, that's quite a bit of money. And um, But... That wasn't the deciding factor. The other schools that were close, you know, there was Ball State or Ball, uh, let's see, Toledo, uh, those schools in Ohio, Akron, you know, the, they were all Ohio University. They were all recruiting me. The smaller schools, the Wittenbergs, uh, Ohio Westlands, um, all those schools. West Virginia was really big. George King was the basketball coach at West Virginia at that time. And I went and visited there. And um, Locke Mueller was the assistant coach and he was originally from Indiana. And um, I, you know, I really liked West Virginia, especially because of Jerry West and Rod, Hot Rod Dunley, you know, all those great players that they had. Um, but Tennessee kind of won it over. Um, Coach Mears was a great recruiter, and um, it was an opportunity. I went and visited Florida State um, for both basketball and baseball, and um, Florida State, Joe Williams was the head coach, and uh, Licklider was, uh, I think it was Licklider was the bat baseball coach, and he was great. Um, I mean, I've visited both situations and really liked it. Uh, uh, being a, I wasn't, I was 17 years old uh, at that time. I didn't turn 18 until May. Trying to make a decision where to go was, was uh, not easy. Uh, but evidently I made the right one because I've got great teammates. Uh, I don't know if you remember Tom Borwinkle played for Chicago Bulls. Tom was in my class, uh, had uh, Ron Whidbey was in my class. Ron Whidbey played the Dallas Cowboys, was a punter in NFL, set numerous records. Uh, our freshman team, we went 19-2 and two and uh, had great teams. Uh, we won the Southeastern Conference a year after Kentucky uh, lost to Texas Western for the national championship. Uh, we were always a thorn in Adolph Rupp's side, the way we played played against Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich never scored more than 21 points against us. Even though he's averaging 44 a game, we had his dad hated us uh, because of the way he played Pete. And, uh, you know, we, we had great success. We, we, my style of basketball didn't really, uh, I was a fast break, run up and down the floor, shoot the ball. Uh, Coach Mears' philosophy was not that way, uh, but we won, and uh, we had, uh, had great teams uh, through that period of time, and uh, our baseball team won the Southeastern Conference uh, during that time, and uh, so it's, uh, uh, I've been very fortunate. I just, you know, I came, when I came to, to, to Wabash, um, Wabash had experienced losing for those 15 years, from 1961 to 1976. Football only had three winning seasons. Baseball, maybe not one or two, and basketball, none. And, you know, you're talking about three major sports. The other sports were doing okay, but I don't know what the atmosphere on campus was like. 
but from the football team went to the Stag Bowl and lost in the championship in 1977. And from that point on, everything turned around. I'm not sure why. Uh, 1982, we win the national championship. 1982 was a 150 year celebration of the college. I guess the stars were all lined up and for success. Uh, and you know, it was uh, a great experience. You know, anytime I hear the phrase, we were a thorn in the side of Adolf Rupp, it brings a smile to my face. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, I, I remember one game, we went up there to play him, and um, we were in the old Coliseum, and we went on the floor, and the noise that I, they needed the decibel rating for the gym, the noise was unbelievable the people booing us and yelling at us and just screaming. Then the Kentucky players went up and it raised it 10 times above that when the Kentucky players came out. You know, you could hardly hear yourself think going through warmups. Well, then Adolph Rupp walked down through the opening and you thought the roof was going to come off the place. I mean, he was unbelievable uh, what he did and his teams were great. I, uh, Pat Riley is in the same class with me, Louis Dampier from uh, Southport, in Indiana, Indianapolis. Uh, so, you know, we knew those guys. Uh, one time, I'll tell you a good story. One time we were leave, leaving uh, Ole Miss to go to LSU, and we played on Saturdays and Mondays. And so we're leaving on Sunday to go to LSU, and Kentucky was coming in, and they had just played LSU. And we knew each other, all the players. And Mike Pratt was one of the players. He was sitting on the couch there in the lobby and he had his head down. And I said, hey, Pratt, what's the matter? He says, oh, I'm in Rupp's doghouse. I said, how come? He says, Maravich scored 57 points on me. I said, yeah, but you and Issel scored 75, so it didn't make any difference. He says, yeah, but Maravich went two for three from half court. So, uh, you know, we had some great, teams, great experiences, and uh, it was uh, uh, an Adolph Rupp. Coach Mears went after him, and, you know, not many people went after Adolph Rupp. Uh, you know, basketball at that time in the SEC was, uh, was not that big with football, and, you know, uh, uh, with the basketball at Kentucky as it was, uh, so it was a challenge for all the teams, but you know, they didn't really do much as far as basketball at that time. But we had some great coaches come along and uh, uh, do great jobs. And I, something else that probably you know, but people don't know, there were no black athletes in sports in the SEC when I was in school. Uh, the only experience we had was when we went outside to play uh, we played in the Los Angeles Classic hosted by UCLA at Pauley Pavilion when uh, Louis Alcindor was, was a player at UCLA. And so, you know, when we would participate in those types of tournaments, that's the only time we had any play against black athletes. And uh, so it was, it was much different than what I grew up, you know, in Ohio uh, coming from that time. So, the changes came. Vanderbilt uh, recruited the first black basketball player, and he was outstanding. He had to be, and uh, that was the change. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but um, Adolph Rupp uh, recruited Tom Payne, seven-foot black athletes from Kentucky, and uh, those things didn't seem to work out. But, uh, you know, uh, things changed, uh, I feel, for the better and uh, made it uh, exciting. Always evolving, and I hope that we still are evolving. Oh, I think I think it is. Uh, uh, teammates are teammates. Um, athletes are athletes. You know, uh, we all get along uh, for one purpose, and uh, uh, you, you understand your roles and what it's all about. And uh, uh, as long as the coaching is steady and uh, you've got good people around you, it works out. So, so once you got to Wabash and you're a couple of years in and you're not winning, 
are you scratching your head? Are you like, what, what, what did I do? How do you get the ball rolling at Wabash? Well, to tell you the truth, I thought I committed professional suicide. <laughs> I really did. Uh, that's the only word I could come up with um, to describe the feeling. I mean, it was miserable because I'd been successful in high school coach. Uh, and, you know, I got that job and I didn't know anything about coaching. Uh, but again, I had great kids and um, my college coach was a great coach and I w always wanted to learn. So I just did everything I could to learn. I got to Swanee and, and uh, we had success. Uh, John Wooden was very influential in, in my coaching philosophy at that time. I hadn't really developed one, but I got to know him and corresponded with him and uh, that helped. Uh, the changeover at Wabash was players. Uh, my first real recruiting class, uh, we brought in like 17 guys. And of those 17, six of them stayed through and won a lot of basketball games for me. Um, one guy, though, I recruited, his name was Pete Metzlars. Uh, Pete Metzlars was from Michigan. Uh, He's being recruited by football as well. The head football coach came to me and says, hey, look, we've got two guys from Michigan coming to visit this weekend. They want to come see the basketball game and talk to us about football. The one guy wants to play both. Uh, he's quarterback on the football team. He says, we're not that interested in him, but we are in their fullback, and we think if we get him, we'll get the fullback. So we need you to help us recruit the other guy. So I spoke with Mets Lars uh, on Sunday, and um, we had a great time. Um, a week or so later, he's playing in a high school tournament in Michigan. So I took one of my players with me who lived in South Bend. We went up there, they were playing in Benton Harbor, which wasn't very far away. And so um, we went to the game. And so Metzlar's high school team comes on the floor and they're shooting around. He takes off his shooting shirt and his number is 44. Well, the guy that I took with me, his number was 44 his freshman year on the varsity. And he looked at me and he says, coach, he said, that guy can't have my number. And I said, well, we'll worry about that. We got to get him first. After the first half, he looked at me, he says, coach, he said, I'll give him my number. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so we went down after the game and went straight in the locker room. And I talked to him a couple minutes and turned him over to that player. And I guess that was the deciding point. Metzlars came back and visited a couple times. I didn't even know until later. Uh, to see those guys and see the campus uh, on trips coming back from Florida, whatever. And he decided to come. He was a 6'6", 210-pound center and quarterback in high school. Football turned him into a tight end. His senior year, he was six foot eight and weighed 250. Uh, unbelievable coaching uh, to, to get a guy to grow like that and be that. His competitiveness was unbelievable. He would compete for anything. A very intelligent guy, uh, was gonna go to law school if the other things didn't work out. And so he was one of the great athletes that, that I was uh, able to coach and be a part of his life. Great Christian person, great individual, great family guy, uh, lives in South Carolina now, played for the Buffalo Bills in the NFL, participated in the four Super Bowl contests, uh, had a great career in NFL, and uh, was a blessing to be around. You know, you win the national championship in 1982, which um, give us a little bit of not being a Division I school. What, what are the differences? What are the major differences between, that a Division I school gets to do that you guys couldn't do? Well, I never really looked at it, just looked at what we were able to do. Um, you know, the, the NCAA manual was one book for all divisions, one, two, and three. And you know, 1973, division three started, uh, they had division one and two, and basically it wasn't division one and two, it was university division and college division. And they then, the, when they brought in division three, um, you know, it, it was, it took time for it to get settled. 
Uh, they had to, you know, work on the rules and the ideas. There were no scholarships, and so that made a difference. And so uh, they had to make the changes. Uh, I was on the NCAA Basketball Rules Committee for six years in the mid to late, well, early 90s, from 86 to 92. We put in the three-point line, the shot clock, uh, changed the backboards. Uh, and that's when they changed and made three booklets, division one booklet, rules booklet, two and three booklets. So, you know, it, it, it was different, but it was still the same. Uh, when we won the national championship in 82, there were only 32 teams and we were independent. We weren't in a conference at that time. And so we were in the great lakes region with these great teams from Ohio and Michigan uh, who had outstanding programs. And so breaking into the tournament was really hard. That group of guys I spoke about, the six seniors, their junior year, along with Metzlars, uh, we went to the first Division III playoffs in, you know, since 1961. Um, and it was held at Wittenberg University. And uh, we played there the next year, uh, being an independent, we got to go again. And uh, then the third year, uh, we won the national championship. Uh, we were fortunate because um, it was just different. Uh, you know, the notoriety, no one knew uh, the, the press releases in the Indianapolis Star really didn't say much. Uh, it was a big deal for Crawfordsville and Wabash College in Indiana. And, and in fact, uh, we're the only Division III school to win a national championship in basketball at this time. There may be some coming, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an honor uh, to be involved in that. And uh, uh, winning a championship is winning a championship. I don't care what level you're on. Uh, you, you know, it's, it, I look back and it seems like a dream. We celebrated an anniversary um, a couple years ago with the guys, and it was great seeing them. And uh, uh, but it's you know it's it's history. Uh, you're looking back and seeing what it's all about, and it was great. You know, I ask this a lot, uh, uh, this question a lot to coaches that I have on the show. You know, w once you've won the national championship what's it like for opportunities to come to you and you having to turn them down and you're, how does that, how does that work? Uh, well, yes, I had opportunities. I had job offers. Uh, uh, I was offered the associate head coaching position at the University of Hawaii. Frank Arnold was the head coach. He had been an assistant with John Wooden. Um, I, my deal was my family. Uh, it was to make a decision to go someplace was not for me. Uh, coming from Swanee to come to Wabash was an opportunity I felt educationally for my kids, an opportunity for my wife to teach school. Uh, yes, it was an opportunity for me, but uh, I just felt it was more important. So. You know, looking at leaving uh, where I was, I had a great mentor in the athletic director at the College of Worcester, Al Van Wee, and I would talk to him a lot about those things, and he always, hey, why don't you just stay where you are, um, you know, and, and so it would have been adjustment, and, you know, I made a great decision. Uh, I have two kids who are outstanding people. Uh, so, it, you know, it just worked out. And tell us a little bit about what your wife, I mean, I read more about your wife in some of the stuff that I was researching than, than you. Tell us a little bit about your guys' fabulous relationship. Well, you want me to really get emotional? Um, you don't have any issues there to the left or right? Well, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's the wing, wind beneath my wings, that song, um, mm -hmm. they always there. We're coming up on 54 years of marriage. She, uh, 
She's just been great, great person. Super job, mother of the children. I'm sorry, but uh, it's okay. But, uh, I've been blessed. When let, let, let's take a left turn here. When did you pick up the golf sticks? And how good are you at golf? And do, how how much did you enjoy coaching golf? I didn't start playing golf until I was 30 at, in Swanee. Um, I had a friend that was the assistant football coach and track coach came to my house one day and he pulled out of his car a, a bag of golf clubs and he said, uh, look at these. And I looked at the clubs and he says, give me an offer. I said, $50. He said, they're yours. <laughs> so I got some great golf clubs and started playing. We had a little course at Swanee and I played and I was not very good. Uh, baseball, I guess, I don't know. It took a while to get, you know, into the swing of things. But again, I didn't play a lot because of my kids. Uh, we moved to, to Crawfordsville, Wabash College, and I'd play with a neighbor who was a barber. He was off on Wednesdays, and I'd go out with him on Wednesdays, and then I'd play on the weekends with other guys and football coaches and play twice a week. And um, in fact, that barber and I, he was with me when I had my first hole in one. Uh, and so, uh, I just, you know, uh, being competitive, I just wanted to learn, you know, the game when I came to Wabash, uh, also, um, about the second or third year I was there, uh, the golf coach was always the football coach and, um, he needed somebody to take the team in the fall. Well, I couldn't do basketball until October 15th. And so I said, Hey, I'll. I'll take the guy. I like golf. I, I'll take the guys. And so in the fall, I'd work with the golfers and he would set up all the schedule and everything. And, and then that would be over with. And I, I do the basketball and then, you know, and the recruiting and all that. And then in 2004, the system football coach, golf coach, uh, he, uh, took another job in the end of February and they came to me and they said, since you work with the golf team in the fall, could you take them this spring? And uh, I said, well, I need to talk to my wife about this before I make any decisions about doing that. I said, I did the golf in the fall. I did basketball. I said, we're in the playoffs uh, in basketball in a conference tournament. Um, and uh, the, the odd thing was that, uh, uh, I was going to take my wife to Hilton Head for spring break. Uh, she plays golf now, and so we were going to take for spring break. And I thought, they want me to take the golf team to Arizona over spring break and leave her home. I said, I don't think so. So I went to them and I said, well, I'll do the golf. I said, but one thing, she has to come with me to Arizona for the spring break trip. They agreed. So the rest is history. I, I took over the golf program from 2004 uh, until just recently. Uh, so that meant seven years I coached basketball. So, you know, you mentioned my wife. Here I was. I was doing the golf in the fall for six weeks, basketball up until 1st of March. Golf started in February, um, and I did golf until May. Uh, she was outstanding. I, I mentioned her earlier and got a little emotional about it, but she's been my rock all the time. She stood behind me and, you know, raised the kids when I was off recruiting and doing things and did an exceptional job. Uh, I mentioned our, our children, our daughter's a very successful business person, uh, our son's a very successful businessman. He was an all-state player in basketball and baseball, Crawfordsville High School. Um, went on to Creighton University and played basketball there. He's an Indiana All-Star. Uh, had a great career at Creighton. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all because of her. Uh, those things that we did and uh, were able to do, she was the rock. You know, it was interesting when I told, uh, I let everybody know that I was doing the show, uh, Dick Ray, who worked for uh, Channel 8 and for WTHR Channel 13, 
rushed to tell me a story about how he hit a hole in one while he was golfing with you. I know it. It was fantastic. It was Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame golf outing. Uh, okay. Which that, that's coming up uh, August the 19th. Uh, it was great. Uh, guys hit balls on the on the green, and then Dick gets up there and he hits a ball and it rolls right up and goes in the cup. And I it, it and he was, told me uh, he told me and I just want to let you know that I am not good at golf. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my wife has four hole in ones. Oh wow! She's only been playing for about seventeen or eighteen years. That's that's why our our children are such good athletes. So she's she's. She's a pretty good athlete. She doesn't want to say she is, but she's a pretty good athlete. And I'm glad I now have two. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, I can say I at least have two to her four. But, uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, I've, I've been around guys that have had hole-in-ones. It's crazy. Um, this past uh, July, I was at a Wabash golf outing. And uh, we're on our last hole, which is a par three, and it's a hole in one offer of five thousand dollars if you get a hole in one. And so the guy I'm riding with, before we get there, he says, as "Soon as it's over with, I'm leaving." I said, "Okay." So he gets up and he says, "How far?" And I look through my range finder and I said, "It's 153 yards." He takes out his seven iron and hits a hole in one. And gets five thousand dollars. I said, I don't think you're going to leave very, very soon, are you? He said, no, I don't think so. So uh, it uh, it's fun to see. You know, besides besides uh, um, your, your great career and uh, your great relationship with your wife and family, um, I, one of the neatest things I read was a gentleman that uh, played for you that uh, was a Newcastle Trojan, and he played in the you know the world's largest basketball gym, and he said playing there had nothing on playing at Wabash and the, the crowd and the enthusiasm. And I just think that's a huge compliment. So, well, I, I had a pipeline for a small period of time. I had the Tabor brothers, Sean Tabor and then Chad Tabor was an outstanding, outstanding athlete, 6'5", 200, about 190 pounds, could jump, could shoot. Uh, then I got Josh Estel, who holds the school scoring record now, and those two guys probably could have I after their during their senior years in high school college, they probably could have played at Indiana States and the Butlers and the Ball States. In fact, Butler started honing in on my pipeline. They started getting guys from Newcastle because Newcastle's basketball is unbelievable. Uh, their you know their their facility is fantastic, but just uh, you know Steve Alford's name is dad. Uh, the basketball coach when those guys were growing up, um, Kent Benson, you mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, their basketball was was uh, fantastic. Well, I know that you I, – we could probably do a part two, Coach, but I know that you have to uh, go hit the links. Yeah, I've got a tee time at 1030 with uh, some old friends that I play golf with every day. So uh, that's what I'll be doing. So uh, besides playing golf, what else do you, are you still associated with basketball? Do you help out? Is it hard to stay away from the game? Was it hard to step away from uh, actually coaching? Uh, yeah, it was hard. Uh, that last year was really hard because I had five seniors coming back. Four or five seniors were outstanding individuals. Uh, and um, But it was time. I was 65 uh, again. Uh, I felt I needed to spend more time with the woman that uh, was the rock of our family, uh, do things with her. And so uh, stepping away, yeah, I miss it. I go over and watch basketball practice and I talk with the coach and he's a great guy, Kyle Brummett, doing a super job and enjoy uh, watching the guys and seeing how they play. The game has changed quite a bit since I retired. Uh, I look at it sometimes and call it helter skelter basketball because uh, there's there is movement, organized movement. The good coaches have real good organized movement. Some of the weaker coaches just have helter skelter basketball, uh, but it's different. Uh, uh, I've seen I, I do a lot of speaking about basketball history and how it's changed and uh, what it's come to. 
and uh, it's interesting to see the changes. But uh, no, I don't miss it. I'm busy around the house uh, doing things. Fortunately, I've, you know, my health is fairly good, and, uh, so I'm able to play golf. And my wife and I do stuff, and um, you know, we just uh, at this time during this COVID-19 situation, we kind of hunker down and wear our masks and social distance, wash our hands, and try to stay safe and uh, do what we can. You know, I, I wasn't a very good basketball player in high school. Matter of fact, I probably wasn't a basketball player in high school, but I really, really love doing this and help keep the nostalgia alive. And um, this was fantastic. And I think um, there's going to be a lot of enjoyment from this interview. Coach Mac Petty, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for asking me.